प्रभु तव मूर्ति विनोदकारी पलपन विसरे नहीं जो विसारी जुगल चरण सोल चिन्ह जेह नजर समीपे रहो अमारी एह नजर समीपे रहो अमारी एह घनश्याम महाराज नी जय हरि कृष्ण महाराज नी जय स्वामी नारायण भगवान नी जय सुप्रीम ओम आई our beloved Gansham Maharaj, the path maker to our liberation, our dear Puja Guruji, Puja Santo and all of you Bhaktos, Jai Swami Narayan. As all of you know, that by the inspiration of our Puja Guruji, Puja Niskam Swami is or has been doing Yuva Sabha. Yuva is the age from 18 to 45. Now, Puja Swami has been performing this Katha in the language of Gujarati. But by His inspiration and through His motivation, what He was thinking was that for those who do not know the language of Gujarati, they lack the fluency, and those who do not comprehend completely, what about for them? What should we do for them? How can we also engage them in our Loyadam Parivara Satsang? How can we keep them God oriented, Sadpurush oriented? What are the ways to do it? So Puja Swami thought. And upon thinking, he said that if his katha, which he does every Saturday in the evening times from 9.30 Eastern, Eastern time to 10.30, if it was translated in English, meaning the main main points, if they were ex extracted in English and made into a PDF, and nonetheless, that PDF, if there was an English katha done on that very PDF of those points, then we can send these links out to all of you who are yuks, all of you still striving satsang, all of you still are thirsty to absorb the principles of Bhagwan Swami Narayan, the knowledge of our Satpurush who have received in the form of our Puja Guruji, and Loyadam Parivar in general. For that very purpose, by the inspiration of Puja Guruji and by Swami's Shubh Sankalp, we have decided to start a English Yuva Sabha course based off of Swami's Gujarati uh, Katha that he does on Saturday nights. Now this is the very first course of February 2nd, 2019. This is Yua course, which is for the ages of 18 to 45. Before we get into Puja Swami's Katha, I would like to explain the whole layout. Whenever he does Katha, there will be a course created in English until the month of June. When he ends in the month of June, an exam will be created off of the PDF packets that you will be receiving. From there, the examination will be taken, and in our upcoming Sadguru Smriti Mahotso 3, in the end of July 2019, uh, there will be uh, winners from first, second, and third, and something, some kind of token will be given by the hands of Puja Guruji, token of Prasadi from his hands. But it's strongly and highly recommended that all of you who are wanting more satsang yet cannot absorb that much due to that language barrier to engage in this activity, to engage in this program of uh, studying for the material, listening to these weekly kathas, 
um, reading the PDF packets, even listening to Puja Niskam Swami's Gujarati Katha, as much as you can understand, and then taking the examination in June so that you can also be a part of Loedam Parivar in the fashion of not only as a person, but in the fashion of principles. Siddhants meaning knowledge in the form of who we are, what kind of Satpurush we have received, etc., so on and so forth. Nonetheless, Pujaswami has, by his wish, given me this seva. I'm going to take this as a seva, not that I'm doing Kathavarta, because all the points that I'll be covering, the main principles, essence of Pujaswami's Katha is coming from Pujaswami. None of these principles are mine. Uh, I can only take that gratitude that Swami has given me this seva. So all these principles that you'll be listening to, you can also listen in Gujarati as well, is of Puja Swami. So without further ado, let's begin uh, with this UA course, 2019, February 2nd. Uh, age, for ages 18 to 45. So what Puja Swami did on Saturday was just take us, uh, he read a Gunati Tamnan Swami Nivat that I'm going to read to you first in um, the language of Gujarati and then it's translated as well. For you, you'll be getting all this material and then we'll move on from there. Sadguru Gunati Tamnan Swami Nivato Swami Narayan Hare, Swami Narayan Hare સ્વામીએ વાત કરી છે ભગવાનનું ને આ સાધુનું જ્ઞાન જેને થયું છે તેને કાંઈ કરવું રહ્યું નથી તે તો અહીંયા છે તો પણ અક્ષરધામમાં ભેડો જ છે માટે પાંચ માળા વધુ ઓછું ફરશે તેની ચિંતા નથી તે તો સામર્થ્ય પ્રમાણે વર્તું પણ ભગવાનને ને આ સાધુને બે જીવમાં રાખવા ને આપણે સાધનનું બળથી મોટાઈ નથી પણ ઉપાસનાની બળથી મોટાઈ છે દિસ ઇઝ વોટ ગુનાતીતાનંદ સ્વામી સેડ જસ્ટ અ બ્રીફલી ટેલ યુ સદગુરુ ગુનાતીતાનંદ સ્વામી વોઝ વન ઓફ ધ પ્રોમનન્ટ ઇલીટ સંતોઝ ધ ફાઈવ હન્ડ્રેડ આઉટ ઓફ ધ ફાઈવ હન્ડ્રેડ નન સંતોઝ ધટ ભગવાન સ્વામિનારાયણ ડાયરેક્ટલી બ્રોટ ડાઉન ફ્રોમ અક્ષરધામ હિયર ટુ સ્પ્રેડ હિઝ સત્સંગ ના પૂજ્ય સ્વામી વોઝ ધ હેડ ઇન મહંત ઓફ Junagadh Mandir and he stayed there for 40 years and managed as in as an administrative role of pretty much the whole temple looking after it but by the commands of Maharaj Bujaswami Agna was to talk talk about the glory of Bhagwan talk about the glory of his Satpurush talk about Sobhaos of vices etc so on and so forth Now, he did this in a Sabha Mandap, and what would happen is Hari Bhaktos and Santos would gather and sit and listen to Swami Nivato. Now, for that 40 years time span, all these, all these talks were collected, and then a book was made after Swami went to Akshar Dham, which is called Sadguru Gunatitan Swami Nivato. From that Vat, from that book, There is this one vat that we just read over. Now it's going to be in English, and then we'll understand uh, the version of what Swami is taking out from these principles. English version of Swami Nivat. The one who has knowledge in the form of experience of God and his son has nothing else left to do. Even if that person is here, he is an Akshar Dham. Therefore, don't worry if one spends five maras more or less. That is based off of one's capacity. However, keep the God and the Son in one's soul. Our greatness is not based on the strength of our endeavors, meaning sadhan, but our greatness is based on the strength of worship, meaning upasna. Gunatitan Svanivat Prakran 1 221 Vat 
from this we can understand a lot swami's level of understanding jiniskam swami's level of understanding of selecting this talk and explaining it it's something beyond comprehension yet extracting main main points from his gujarati uh, katha we would like to briefly go over for all of you to understand and all of you to pick up his vato while swami was doing this katha he read this uh, vat and then he picked on some bhaktos regarding this vat a couple of questions and then swami said that after some time passes in satsang we tend to make everything habitual but we tend to forget to keep repeating the knowledge we have gained through san samagam i mean the main word when i heard about this vat was habitual habitual meaning our day to day life for example in the morning suppose uh you have a career you work so in the morning your scheduled time you wake up uh you do all your hygienic duties and then you do puja then you go to work you go to work your work starts at 9 and you come back at 5 after you come back you cook some dinner for maharaj do the aarti serve thaad to bhagwan and then you partake in the prasad maybe listen to some live katha and then if you have some time socialize or what not and then go to sleep and call it a day monday to friday our whole life is habitual there's nothing new that happens or occurs it just happens it's just your mind has been trained to wake up this time to do this at this time it's just one after another one after another it's not about getting tired it's not about even excessive work it's kind of just like a maintain routine that you know you have to do in your life and can't wait for that saturday or or sunday to come by for something a new change to occur in one's life but what swami is talking about here is in satsang i give you an example which is related to our world that you can comprehend you can relate to but in the matter of satsang you think about it the first day that you entered into mandir the first day you had the darshan of pyura gansham maharaj the first day you engage with santos talk with them related with them remember that day and think about in your heart in your mind what kind of thoughts were occurring how much of a new place you thought you're in think about all the thoughts and then as time go went by as we started to do more satsang as we started to understand bhagwan swamiran's principles as we started to know more hari bhaktos and loya dam parivar slowly but surely it got habitual it got habitual in the form of yeah it's here and i have to go to mandir and it's just there the progress that was occurring initially from the start it hasn't declined but it, it's kind of at that flat line now the reason for that swami said that we tend to forget to keep repeating the knowledge we have gained through sant niva sant samagam we tend to forget meaning we hear something that swami has said in katha sure we listen to it we even find it as a good point we think that this is one of the points that we've never heard in our life so it even sticks to our mind for a little while but then when we step out of mandir when we go back to our habitual life our regular routine life it kind of washes away like an instant doesn't take too much time then we come back to mandir the next week after and then again we listen to some new vato new talks new knowledge new principles and again we think wow i've never heard that before that's something new that's something that i never knew about after thinking in that fashion then again you walk out the door and it's forgotten 
The very reason for that is because we have not repeated the knowledge or principles that we have received through Sansamagam. That's why our life becomes a regular norm instead of in I'm all, this vat is strictly regarding satsang. It's not regarding anything outside. I'm talking about in satsang, we start to hit that flat line where it's just there. We come and go, we come and go. There is nothing new. There is no progress. And the reason for that is not repeating the knowledge we have received. Moving on. How can one identify if we have pure wisdom regard, regarding God and his Satpurush. How can we know that we have... Wi See, there's two words. Wisdom versus knowledge. Now, obviously, when you think about it in your mind, when you, lis when you listen to or hear the word knowledge, automatically you know it's something to do with academics, something to do with some historical facts, something to do with... Uh, containing a lot of information in your brain when you think about knowledge. But when someone mentions the word wisdom, just wisdom, a couple things pop into our mind. It's natural instinct. But wisdom, we think about saints. We think about great yogis. We think about wisdom in the form of uh, a nirvana and high knowledge that is not comprehended completely because they are two different words obviously but what Swami is talking about here is wisdom over knowledge knowledge is something that yeah many many people millions and millions and billions and billions of people have in the world knowledge is something that can be related to any field may it be academics or may it be work related or may it be social skills or may it be business skills or may it be any other how you need knowledge as a human being to do something it's a very very natural natural uh, inclination of the human mind but wisdom that's not something that everyone possesses strictly talking about spiritual wisdom here Wisdom, spiritual wisdom, when we think about it, that's not something that we know and can identify that, oh, that person definitely has spiritual wisdom and that person definitely does. We can say that for someone who has knowledge, how so? He's very smart at math. I mean, or all the history information that he has completely absorbed, it's amazing. That's why he aced the test. Yeah, we can relate to someone who has knowledge, but we cannot identify. We cannot tell if another person, an individual, has wisdom. That's something that's very, very rare. That's something that that's very, very uh, secretive, yet it's open, if we can say, in satsang. And that's the, that's the, the point that Swami wanted to cover. First, I want to give you an example according to our norms here, our environment, and then I'll give you the example of, of Swami gave, of this so-called word of wisdom. Wisdom, you can also call it experience. We can relate them together. Something that you have experienced versus something that you have just known. For example, suppose you're very, very, very hungry. And your favorite food is pizza. Now, your friend calls you and he tells you that, oh, this new place has opened, has the best pizza, describes all the different kinds of toppings and flavors, and you're, you're, just, you're just ready to go to that place at once and just completely engross yourself in eating pizza. You heard all that knowledge. Does that mean that your stomach is filled? No. Versus you going to that place, you making it, placing an order, you putting that food inside of your mouth. That's an experience. The thing at first, your friend when he called and gave you all that knowledge, 
of how the pizza is, what it tastes like, all the different flavors, toppings, that's just knowledge. But when you went there and you ate the pizza, that's actually called experience. Now for Pujaswami's example, millions of followers have knowledge that this Maharaj is supreme. But how many can experience this? How many can experience Bhagwan's form? You can see the difference right away. Experience versus versus knowledge. It's right there, right in front of you, black and white. <laughs> Moving on. When you, fre when you freshly enter satsang, your enthusiasm and zeal is ever-growing. Then after some time goes by, it becomes moderate. And then after some more time goes by, that enthusiasm, enthusiasm and zeal becomes nominal to none. This is something we can all relate to. Those who are new, if you examine yourself right now, your enthusiasm, your zeal for having the darshan of Gansha Maharaj, having the darshan of Santo and Bhakto, meeting them, doing Sant Samagam, that's very high. But for those who have passed some years, past maybe five, six, seven years, it becomes very, very normal. It becomes very, very day-to-day, uh, -day, just like how we talked about previously. Due to that factor, we cannot get the, the maximum amount of merits or fruits that we want out of satsang. From this, I thought about, suppose there's a kid who uh, plays uh, video games, and he finds out that this video game is coming out this date. He pre-orders it and puts it on reserve. And then the first thing, uh, when it comes, he opens it up and just starts playing and playing and playing. He plays so much that he forgets about eating. He forgets about school. He forgets about everything else. He just want, He is completely engrossed in that game. Now that same very game that he was enthused about, that he was excited about, that he couldn't live without, after six months, if you have that person keep playing continuously, after six months, if you examine his enthusiasm level, his, his uh, level to uh, completely play the game and do nothing else, if you observe, it would be moderate to nominal. Why so? It's the same game. The game hasn't changed. It's the same player, or you can say that uh, council. It's the same thing. It's the same TV. It's the same couch. It's the same remote control. Everything is the same. Why did your, why did that kid's zeal, why did that kid's enthusiasm become moderate to none? What is the reason? It got old. That very same game that he couldn't wait for, that he put on reserve, when he started to play it, first couple months, there was nothing else but that game for him in the world. Slowly after some time, it got tiring. And then finally, that enthusiasm goes away, washes away, and now he hears about a new game that's coming out. So then again, he puts it on reserve and the whole cycle goes on and on. In the same way in satsang, when we freshly enter satsang, it's new. But then, it starts to get a little dim and then completely dim. What is the reason for this? Why does this occur? That's what we want to find out today from Pujaswami's Kathavarta. Moving on. If we keep account of how much progress and regress we are, we are experiencing in satsang, we'll be able to identify where we stand. Very simple and straightforward, but always with an example. Um, in business, suppose you're a business owner. Now, obviously, you have an inventory list. 
you know what you have to order, you know what you have to do, you know what kind of bills you have to pay. But the main account book always has two columns, deposit and withdrawal, meaning income and outcome. How much income am I making? How much profit am I making? And how much am I spending versus that? That's always in consideration. That's always something that that businessman has to look at and is looking at. May it be with stress or may it be with happiness. But that's something that that businessman is always looking at. From that perspective, we can take that that businessman kept an account throughout of how many transactions, how, how much uh, income, how come, everything, everything, inventory, each down to the penny. He kept track of everything. Due to that, at the end, he would be able to see, he was able to see the profit or the loss he had for his business. In the same manner, over here, we can relate this to satsang, how so? Every day we do satsang, somehow via listening to katha, somehow listening to kirtans, somehow connecting ourselves with Bhagwan, his satpurush, and santo, bhakto. Through time, a chart should be developed in our life of how much progress we're making and how much regress. And you're probably wondering, how did you do that? Well, there's many lie detectors outside that all of you know about machines that organizations like the FBI, CIA, and other organizations they possess. But our heart, you can say our soul, that's one lie detecting machine that will never fail or go bad. Because when we ask ourselves, are you progressing or are you regressing? Automatically, a voice will come out saying, no, you're actually progressing and you're going higher in satsang. Or, it wasn't the same as before. That thought will occur. That's when you can know and notion down, write down, that right now in my life, on this date, uh, satsang is now flourishing or satsang is becoming dim. I need to start pepping it up more. I need to start doing something that will, uh, that will increase my satsang. But only this, this, these kinds of thoughts can only happen for a person who keeps an account book in the fashion of at least writing down, if not day to day, on a weekly basis of how much satsang you have been engaging in and, and through that, we'll be able to progress slowly but surely. I mean, even if we look at it from a physical standpoint, we keep account of one thing that we don't keep account of anything else for. May it be in the morning, may it be in the evening, may it be in the afternoon. But we keep a very, very accurate account of our weight. In the morning, you weigh yourself, you weigh 150 pounds. Then at night, you come and weigh yourself. After dinner, you weigh 154 pounds. And then again in the morning, back to 152, 150, 149. Every day, it's a record. Every day, you keep an account of your weight or if not every day, at least weekly. And due to that, you can tell. And f by looking at yourself physically, you also can tell, oh, I need to weigh myself. I think I'm getting a little heavier. Such kinds of things happen because we have a constant, you can say, awareness that we need to keep account of our weight. We can't look too fat in society. What will others think? Due to that, we keep an account. But... No one thinks about what will Maharaj and what Puja Guruji will think if I don't keep an account in satsang. If my satsang regresses, if my satsang goes down, what will Maharaj and Guruji think? No one thinks like that. That's why it's our time now to wake up. It's our time to think about 
I've been doing satsang for this many years. Am I progressing? Am I regressing? And what will Maharaj and Guruji think? What will Santos think? Santos who have been putting an effort behind doing all, all, all these katha vartas and, and organizing programs and all for us. Then what will they think if I'm regressing? What will they think? If we think in this fashion, if we start to keep an account, then slowly but surely we'll start to progress in satsang. When we had first entered satsang, we were meek, meaning dasna das. But as time went by, we started to argue, comment others, and think of others' bad qualities. What is the reason for this? This is something that's probably definitely hitting your head. Because it's definitely something, a point that everyone can relate to. Think out of a new person at school, a new kid, for example. When the very first day of school, or we can even say the very first day of work. Well, we'll take the school example. The very first day of school, you're very new, you're timid. You don't know what others will think of you. Have you worn the right clothes? How about the right hairstyle? You're very, very fragile. You don't want to hurt anyone. You don't want to say something to another person that will disturb them or might make them angry. You want to just be very, very quiet and very, very dim, low-key and just get by the first day. Find your classes. Find your uh, classes on time. Get to class on time. Maybe make a couple of friends, but nothing too much outside. Very, 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 very meek. But that was just the first day of school. After a week goes by, normal. A month goes by, a little more engaging. Six months, one year, two year. A junior in high school, by the time you're a junior, you feel like you're the king of the high school. What happened? The very first day, we thought, oh, I hope I don't disturb anyone. But after three years, you got acquainted with everyone. You got acquainted. You made new friends. You familiarize yourself with everyone. And you feel like you did something for your school. May it be join a club. May it be write a newspaper article. Or may it be play sports and win a game or two. May it be even honor roll, so on and so forth. But due to those achievements, you thought that now you're the king of the whole school. But what happened to that little boy, that freshman year little boy, when he entered, how his behavior was? This doesn't mean that you shouldn't engage in clubs or sports or get good grades. You maintain all of that by staying meek, by staying inferior, by staying das na das. This is the whole message behind the, this point. When we had first entered satsang, we were meek. Now going back to satsang. But as time goes by, we start to argue, comment others, and think of others' bad qualities. Does this happen to us? Think about it. Has this happened to us? Think about it. What is the reason for this? Same thing in satsang. First day you come in, mandir, same exact, same exact, uh, exact uh, notion, don't want to disturb anyone, nothing like that, uh, you know, want to just be polite, maybe serve someone, that's it, nothing else. But then, as time goes by, as you familiarize yourself with the whole place, santos, bhaktos, then you start to realize, oh, you know, this guy has this kind of a nature. It's so bad. Think about it. I mean, he's been going for satsang this many years, this kind of a nature. Oh, my God. This uncle, he is just always on our back about serving. It's just something that is so annoying. We want him to stop. 
what happened? Before, you're very, very timid. But after a couple of years go by and you start to familiarize yourself with everyone, you start to relate. Everyone starts to know you, who you are, how you are. What makes that a right to start arguing with others? What makes or who gives you the right to start thinking about others' bad qualities? That's something that we need to improve on. But Swami asks, what is the reason for this? Why? Why does this occur? The very reason, the answer for that question is our enthusiasm and zeal has decreased in satsang. Progress versus regress. Our enthusiasm in satsang has decreased. Due to that, we start to find faults in others. Due to that, we think of ourselves greater than others. Etc. The list goes on and on. What was the reason for losing that enthusiasm and zeal? Not thinking, not having a thought process of others. Due to that, this this is what happened. Further out, further on, Swami will explain the exact reason. But moving on to the next point. The signature of true spiritual progress is experiencing God ever present in one's life. We come in satsang and do everything like seva, satsang, sansamagam, but true knowledge is experiencing God. You know, after coming into satsang, we tend to know like, we tend to know a couple of vachnamrut, swamini, vato. We have basis knowledge and maybe even a little more. But here, Swami says, true knowledge is experiencing God. All of you have probably seen at least an iceberg on Google Images, I'm sure. If not, some so in real life. But an iceberg, they use this for a psychology example. The iceberg tip is only 10%. 10% compared to the 90% which is underwater. 90% is underwater. You can't see anything. When a ship is going by, it can only see 10%. Similarly, 10% is just us knowing a couple of Vajshamruts here and there, maybe a couple of Swami Nivato, maybe having a couple of years under our belt in satsang. But that 90%, that we have not touched or even scratched, that 90% that we haven't even seen is experiencing God. It's so deep that there is no, you can say, tool to measure how deep it is, meaning God's knowledge, who God is, how He is, the knowledge of the Satpurush, who He is, how He is, something that we can't measure we don't have a long enough measuring stick to completely comprehend their greatness. But in this context, the signature of true spiritual progress is experiencing God ever present in one's life. We come in satsang and do everything like seva satsang, but true knowledge is experiencing God. Seva satsang, everything we do. But true knowledge is that 90%. You're, you're probably wondering, why have we not experienced God? I've been coming to satsang for many years, 5, 10 years. I've been reading a lot of Vachnamrut, Swami Nivato. I've been doing a lot of Sansamagama. Sun why have I not experienced God? What is the reason for this? Is it God's fault? Is it the Satpurusha's fault? Is it Santo and Bhakto's fault? What is it? Or is it my fault? What is the reason why I have not experienced God? I have not attained that wisdom. What is that reason? Well, Swami said bluntly, according to the Vachnamrut, the answer is, the very reason is our carelessness. Gaflai, translated in Gujarati, carelessness. It's our fault. We have to find the reason why we have not experienced God yet. Some kind of leak. 
in a huge ship, just like how the Titanic went across the Atlantic and near the United States coastline, hit by an iceberg, just a tear, not too big, but a tear for a ship that was said to be unsinkable. The whole sink, the whole ship sinks with many, many people who died. Just a small leak, and due to that, everything else goes haywire. In the same way, carelessness may be just a little, but due to that small amount of carelessness, our experience with God is not connected. We, have, we cannot connect with God completely. Another example, may you build a huge machine, but if a small microchip, which is the whole operating system of that machine, if it's not installed properly, or if it's not installed at all, then will the machine work? No. In this context, even if that small microchip in the form of carelessness, if it's not removed or if it's not removed from our heart or installed properly in the form of remo removal, then that machine will not start, we will not experience God. It's simple, straightforward. Then he gave an example of true gnan or wisdom is which that never wavers. Wavers, meaning which never goes up and down. A roller coaster goes up and down, up and down, compared compared to a car which is always leveled. Just an example. Stability equals gnan versus instability equals knowledge. Knowledge is something that comes and goes, comes and goes. May it even be you remember, but it, sometimes it wavers. But Gnan or wisdom is something that is stable. It doesn't go. It's always there. It's always present. Now, this can only be tested in adverse circumstances. Some people even have the confidence to say, some book those that have confidence to say that, I have wisdom, I have gnan, you know. But that can only be tested in adverse circumstances. How so? Let me give you a modern example first. You've heard of the word motion sickness. You know exactly, or at least some of the symptoms of how a person feels dizzy, wants to vomit, and has headaches, stuff like that, but have never experienced it. But suppose when you're sitting in a car, no motion sickness really occurs, but you go on a ship, or you go on a roller coaster, then only after experiencing the highs and lows will you be able to completely understand and know if you have motion sickness or not. It's just a test. In the same way, this kind of knowledge versus gnan can only be experienced, can only be tested in adverse circumstances, when everything goes against us, when everything is completely on one side and you're, on, you're alone on the other side, then it can only be tested. And then afterwards, Swami gave a, uh, an example of a charitra of Sadguru Sri Nurshyanan Swami that uh, I want to tell you about. Once upon a time in the village of Gadara, Nurshyanan Swami uh, he was a son of Bhagwan Swaminarayan. He went to urinate, okay? And he went off and he went to urinate in one area. And then when he was coming back, something must have happened. And he, his body he must have like uh, some kind of instability. And he fell. Now, there was a, always in that area, there was a bullock there. And bullocks have a tendency, as all of you know, 
that if anything touches their horns or their head, then they tend to throw that completely away. It's just a basic instinct nature. If you touch any other part of a bullock, may it be a tail, leg, stomach, body, it would do nothing. But if you touch its head or its horns, that then it would throw you completely uh, away from you. you. You would just be thrown from it. Now, Swami, while he was walking back after after he did uh, urination, while he was walking back, the bullock was there, and somehow he fell, and he fell right on the head of the bullock. Now, at that time, think about it, it's just an animal. It's nothing mere or less. At that time, that bullock was just about to flip Swami, but it received knowledge through Bhagwan's Krupa, but it, it remembered, it had some kind of knowledge that this Swami I was looking at every time, going back and forth in this area, he was just doing Mada, he wasn't ever disturbing anyone, very calm, no other issues. Now Swami fell on my head, so should I flip him over? This knowledge occurred about Swami, how Swami was like this. He never had heard anyone ever had, had uh, when he was passing through the way. He was always there doing his own work. Now, what should I do in this case? There, right there, instead of flipping Swami over, due to this knowledge, the point is, instead of flipping Swami over, the bullock gently lied Swami down on the ground. And Swami became very happy. And Swami said that you have taken care of me, so now I will take care of you. Now, that's a hidden message, but there was another Swami there, and he was by uh, uh, Nushyan Swami's side. And then after a little while, he asked Swami, Swami, you told the Bullocks this, that what is the reason for this? What, what what's the message behind it he said that this bullock every day he saw me he knew what I did and his base instinct that Bhagwan has given him as an animal is to if anyone touches horns or head to throw that person off but he remembered the bullock remembered that Swami had no other intention he was very very calm and steady due to that he put me down gently so he took care of me in this life. So now I'm going to take care of him by taking him to Bhagwan's Akshar Dham at the end. So what had happened was time went by and Swami, Nushyan Swami left this mortal body and went to Akshar Dham. And this bullock saw this and he started to cry. He started to cry and he stopped eating and drinking completely stopped eating and drinking. On the 13th day, the bullock's, you can say, body fell, mortal body, the animal body fell, and Maharaj and Swami, Nursiya and Swami himself, came to take that, the Atma to Akshardham. This was all due to two or three sentences of Gnan, or knowledge that that bullock remembered at that time. One thing is having knowledge or wisdom, that's completely good, but also applying it at a certain time with accuracy, that's completely another, you can say, topic. That's something that is uh, that needs repetition in, in order for you to, if you keep repeating, then that knowledge will be applied at that time. I mean, I'm reminded of an example of there was a there was a million dollar machine. Now this machine was made in Europe and then brought here in the United States. Now the scientists of the United States they built the machine and everything, uh, you know, put it together and everything, and wanted to start it, but it couldn't start. They tried and tried and tried, 
but it didn't start. They read the directions. They even called the European scientist who, who, who designed the whole machine. And he said, I'm going to have to come there. They said, okay, sure. The European scientist flies over, comes to the United States, and is looking at the machine. He says, oh, this is simple. He takes a very small hammer and just hits it in one small area. And the machine starts up instantly. The United States scientists are baffled. They're surprised. They're like, how'd you do that? What happened? I mean, was there something else you did? Or what did you do? How? He said and explained that I'll let you know what I did later. But as for my charge, as for my feet, I want $1 million. The United States scientists, all of them were scratching their heads. They're like, you just came today and you're in the lab for 30 seconds and you hit it in one place and it starts. How can we give you $1 million? Then that scientist said, the European scientist, that $999,000 is for me starting the machine up in that very in that very precise you can say spot and one dollar is for me to come here what is the moral of this story accuracy at that point in time that scientist hit that machine exactly pinpoint in that one area due to that the machine got completely started Similarly, if we can comprehend knowledge, wisdom, yes, we listen to it, have it, but two faults, repetition and accuracy. If one starts to repeat, then we'll, one will start to remember more and more that, oh, Bhagwan is the all-doer. Knowledge like this, Maharaj is supreme over anyone, and, and, and our Satpurush, our Puja Guruji, is from directly from Akshardham. He is Ekantik. He is not of this world. Even if his body is here, he is in Akshardham, constantly has connection with the Bhagwan. All these different thoughts, if we start to repeat, then if some kind of adverse time comes, and suppose we do something uh, and we get a lot of praise for it, if we don't have the accuracy of remembering, oh yeah, Bhagwan is Karta. Guruji is karta. He is. They are the all. They are doing it. It's not mine. Then that knowledge will go to waste. But if we remember and hit it with accuracy, then no other you can say uh, base evil instincts such as ego, jealousy, greed would come up, and we'd say we would stay peaceful, and Bhagwan and Guruji would become pleased. That's why we need knowledge. To protect what we have. Moving on. According to Swami Nivato, the one who has such gnan of Maharaj and his Satpurush, he has nothing else left to do. He is fulfilled. He knows by staying joined with this Maharaj and Satpurush, he'll receive the same attainment as the Satpurush does. Meaning, in Sadguru Gunandya and Swami Nivat, Swami says, such a person who has received this knowledge has nothing else to do what is that nothing else well think about how many spiritual endeavors we can do think about how many dharna parnas or maras and dhanots we can do but by staying in the company of a sat purush like, like our puja guruji by having a connection with him by keeping association with him according to the vachanamra the same the same attainment he receives, we'll receive. If he, he'll he receive Bhagwan, then we'll also receive Bhagwan. May it be a little later on, but we'll get the same attainment. That's final. I mean, yes, you're sitting in Mercedes Benz, a very, very high class Mercedes Benz. Yeah, you didn't get to sit in the front seat. You wanted to. You didn't get to drive the car, but at least you got to see, sit in the back seat. At least you're inside of the Mercedes-Benz. 
suppose you fly to India in uh, in Emirates or the Etihad, those very high class uh, airlines, airline companies. Yes, you didn't get to get the ten thousand dollar that ten thousand dollar room for that one flight one way. No, you didn't get to stay there, but you're still sitting inside of Etihad in economy class and you're getting to your destination. That's what counts. In the same way, yeah, we have these kinds of faults, so on and so forth. No problem. But we have our Satpurush, we have our plane, we just have to sit in it and he'll drop us off to our destination, which is Akshardham. Moving on, Swami says, everything begins with vichar, meaning starting a thought process. The more you repeat something in your mind, the more it becomes firm and stable. Obviously, this is very simple. By repetition of Maharaj, Satpurush, Santo, and Bhaktos Mahima, one becomes humble, inferior, and meek, meaning dasna das. The more you repeat, this Maharaj is this great, our Satpurush, he is so great, yet, even during winter workshop, he played with young, young six-year-olds, musical chairs. How could he be at such a high position and how could he do the same thing? Or, or, or how, could he, how could he act also in such a manner? If you think about it in the world, those who have very high statuses, they can't come low. They can't sit on the floor. They need a special seat. They need some kind of a place where they're highlighted to the maximum. But the Satpurush, the Satpurush in the form of our Puja Guruji, you'll see that Satpurush doing Katha and Vyaspit. You'll see that Satpurush sitting on a sofa. And you'll also see that Satpurush mopping the floor. You'll also see that Satpurush serving santos and bhaktos. You'll also see that Satpurush taking care of others. That very notion, that very you can say, experience, if we remember that, then only will we develop maima, And we have to keep repeating, repeating. It can't just happen once and then you don't remember for another six months. Bhagavan Swamiran gives a beautiful example in the Vachnamrut by stating that if you have one pot of water and and it's it's just a full put of, pot of water and you go and you pour it in one area and then you don't do anything for one month that place that very place will become dried up in a couple of days but suppose you don't have a big pot of water but you have a very very small sp sprinkle of water but it's continuing it's constant in that one area then that land will stay moist even if you come back after a month or six months or even a year. In the same way, repetition, if you keep it constant, that this Maharaj is like this, this Guruji is like this, this Sant is like this, this Bhagat is like this, meaning their qualities, their greatness, and thinking of yourself as very meek and low. I don't have that quality, but this Sant is very, very highly, he has very high qualities, and I'm very fortunate to be in his presence. By thinking like this, automatically maima would occur, maima would ignite in the form of a small, at first, a small, small, you can say, flame, and then become greater and greater and greater. And the more you churn, the more you churn, the more you think, the more you think, the fire becomes bigger and bigger. The more you develop maima of others, the more and more you will, you will, uh, become happier and happier in satsang. Nonetheless, one becomes dear to Maharaj by thinking like this, by having a thought process of, of maima, of others. Bhagwan, you become very dear to Maharaj. If we have developed some kind of abhav, bad quality of a Hari Bhagat, if we have repeated that person's good quality, then the bad quality would go away. Only if you have repeated. If you just remember once and then after five years, 
you remember it again, it doesn't really matter, it doesn't really count, you can't apply it anywhere. And finally, Mahima of other stays alive. Something that we have to do in satsang constantly, staying alive. Staying alive, you're probably thinking physically, no. Staying alive meaning ever growing, progressing more and more every day, little by little, towards Bhagwan, towards the Ekantik Satpurush. Slowly but surely, baby steps, but at least we're alive, at least we're moving. It's not like we're going back. That's something that is done when we start to repeat the Mahima of Maharaj, Guruji, Santo, and Bhakto in Satsang. Moving on. Kalyan, meaning liberation from this whole cycle of birth and death, is based off of Mahima of Maharaj, Satpurush, Santo, and Bhakto. Whosever Mahima we have, will auto automatically develop trust in their words. This example is very, very, uh, you can say, uh, frequent, but it's something to definitely think about. A doctor. You go to a doctor, you take the prescription prescribed without even identifying or searching about what this medicine does, what its side effects are. You don't even know the doctor's name. Completely, full name, middle name. You just know Dr. John, so, so on and so forth. You don't know the doctor's marital status. You don't know if the doctor has a family. You don't know if the doctor himself has a disease. You don't even know if the doctor actually has a diploma from med school. You haven't seen it. You don't know. Yet, upon prescription, upon writing on a piece of paper with some numbers and some identification codes on, a person takes the medicine, not a person, us. We take the medicine and until it's prescribed, oh, take it day and night and you'll feel better in five days. We take it so blindly with full trust. Nonetheless, an airline pilot. We want to go from here to India. Sure, no problem. But when we go inside, the very excitement of going on a plane, going 40,000 feet in the air, reaching India, that's all going through our head. But we never tend to think about how much experience does this pilot have? What's the pilot's name again? Oh, wait, does this pilot really a pilot? Or, I mean, obviously airlines only hire real pilots, but how much experience? I mean, we're not looking at only a couple of years, are we? I hope he doesn't crash the plane at 40,000 feet in the air. None of these thoughts ever go through our mind. We are completely in trust. We even play those video games and play movie, watch movies. And then we go to sleep and eat the meals and it's just a great time and that's it. There's no other thought process that occurs that what if he goes to sleep? What will happen or... We don't even know his full name. We haven't even seen his face because he doesn't ever come out of the cockpit. Then think about it. We put so much trust in, we put our, not trust, we put our life in the hands of a pilot and a doctor. Then why can't we put our life, maybe not physical, but our spiritual life in the hands of our Sadpurush, in the hands of Maharaj? Why can we not? What is taking us back? Why are we lagging this point in our life? That's why in this Katha Swami says, Kalyan is based off of that Mahima. If you develop Mahima, if you develop trust completely, then your Kalyan is done. There's nothing else left for you to do. If the Satpurush says, do this, do that, if it's day and he says it's night, you go to sleep. If it's night and he says it's day, you wake up. It becomes very, very easy, but only if that maima is developed. And that very way to develop maima is repetition. To put blind trust in Satpurush is the very form of gnan. Whenever you get a chance to talk about the glory and greatness of Maharaj, Satpurush, Santon, Bhakto, you should do so. May it be taking a prasad in mandir, or may it be outside 
maybe you acquainting yourself with a new friend, you should always talk about, hey, we have this mandir here, we have this Bhagwan here, he is supreme. Due to these factors, he is supreme. Our Satpurush here is this great. Our Maharaj here, is, our, our, our Bhaktos, our Santos are like this. We should have a natural inclination. When we tend to gather together with uh, Bhaktos, or maybe even outside friends, we always talk about everything else besides the Mahima of Maharaj, Guruji, Santo, and Bhakto. And that is definitely a guarantee that you'll agree upon. Coming into our conclusion, this is the whole highlight point of Swami's Katha. He even says that this is the main sar or essence of this Katha. He says the very essence of today's Katha is keeping, keep repeating the knowledge you have of Maharaj, Satpurush, Santo, and Bhakto in your mind. You can do you can do this while you can do this while doing everything in sansar. This does not need any special time, meaning while driving, while eating, while 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 sitting down, while even walking. It's your brain does not need to engage completely in any of those activities. You can also multitask. Bhagwan has installed a feature in our brain to multitask. You can do that. It is an option to take. But it's all a matter upon us. Do we want to take that option? Do we want to repeat the Mahima of Maharaj, Guruji, Santon, Bhakto in our heads constantly? And you're probably saying, what kind of Mahima? How can I get this Mahima? By listening to Katha Varta. Simple. By listening to Katha Varta, by listening to the Charitras of Maharaj, by listening to the Charitras of his Ekantik Satpurush, our Puja Guruji, you can automatically get those kinds of thoughts, Mahima thoughts. This is the first step to remembering the idol of Maharaj. Learn to think about Maharaj and Satpurush, how they are, who they are, what they have done for us. To hold Maharaj, Maharaj in one's heart, one needs Mahima. Mahima develops in our heart by repetition. Simpler, simple, it's like a equation. If you want to hold Bhagwan in your heart, you need Mahima. In order to develop Mahima, you need repetition in your mind about the Mahima of Maharaj Guruji Santon Bhakto. To have stable Mahima, to have wisdom, to have stability. That's that's what Swami is getting at here. I mean may it be calculus, may it be physics or chemistry, we have to memorize many equations in order to apply them in our examination. In the same way, our life is an examination. By taking the equation of Mahima, thinking about, thinking about it and applying it, we'd be able to pass the test and go to Akshradham. So this was February 2nd, 2019, U.S. Sabha Course 1 Katha that Puja Swami did. Off of this, uh, to the best of my ability, by the grace of Guruji and by Swami's inspiration, I've tried to translate as best as possible. If some kind of message you don't understand, the Gujarati link of Puja Swami's Katha is also incorporated, so you'll be able to listen in. If so, if you have any questions, you can always email at loyadamnj at gmail.com. But this course is now specially designed for all of you who are ages 18 to 45 to understand Bhagwan, Guruji, how they are, and to relate. Due to the language barrier, it has been translated into English, and you'll be able to listen in, and an examination will be or can be given to enroll for this uh, Sabha. You can just email us at loyadamnj at gmail.com and we'll be more than welcome to join you in. Jai Swami Narayan.